Uh, hello, and again, welcome to this talk about Project Loom. Uh, my name is Lukáš Křičan, I'm Senior Software Engineer at Product Board. And the message for today is that today, if you are uh, implementing a code on JVM, you have to pick between two options. One is to write simple, easy to understand code, and the other one is to write scalable code, but that is hard to understand because it's asynchronous with a lot of callbacks and stuff like that. And you cannot have both. Both. You can either have thread-based simple code or asynchronous complicated code. And Project Loom, once it's released, uh, will give you both. And that's what we are going to talk about. Uh, the agenda is we will address the blocking code first, uh, then we will talk about reactive uh, code and uh, coroutines in Kotlin, and then we will talk how, about how uh, Project Loom is going to help us in the future. Sorry. Uh, and uh, we will be talking about typical JVM application that I'm working on for basically my whole professional life. And it's basically this kind of application that it's based on the HTTP request or some request coming from the client. It can be REST or GraphQL or SOAP or whatever. Then it does some uh, request validation, transformation and whatnot. And then it calls some downstream service. It can be a database, it can be another service, but basically it's a, a, another a network call. And then it waits for the response, then it transforms the response and returns it back to the client. And the, the, the issue with this type of application is that it's basically waiting all the time. That's why the Duke is standing like that because it's waiting all the time. It's not CPU heavy. And of course, on GVM, you can do data processing, which is the CPU heavy, or you can do machine learning or whatnot, but that's not what we are going to talk about today. Today, we will be talking about this typical JVM application. And for demo, we have a simplified version of that. Uh, we have some random number service that generates a random number after some delay. And our service is going to call it and take the random number and multiply it by two and return it uh, up to the client. So let's see the code. And yeah, it's simplified application. Uh, in your pro production code, you would have more layers or and, uh, stuff like that. But basically, this is it. This is what we do for a living. Uh, we have a controller. It's built on Spring Boot, uh, Spring MVC. Uh, we have two parameters. One is specifying delay. The default value is 100 milliseconds. And then we basically call another service uh, and pass in the delay. delay. And uh, the other service generates a random number after the delay, and then we take the result and multiply it by two and return it back to the client. Uh, it's pretty simple. So let's see if it works. Uh, I will call it, and yeah, we got a random number multiplied by two. And okay, so this is uh, quite simple. Uh, let's try something else. Let's try what happens if uh, exception happens. If I pass in a negative number for the delay, it takes some time, but we get an error. That's what we wanted to get. And if we see the exception, it's actually useful. It shows me uh, where the error happened. It shows me, okay, in demo controller, we have an error here. And yeah, basically this, this call failed. Uh, this seems obvious, but later you'll see it's not so obvious. And let's now think about scaling. Because today we are going to talk about scaling and about concurrency. So how many requests are we able to process in uh, a second? So each request takes approximately 100 milliseconds. Uh, let's say it's exactly 100 milliseconds to simplify. So one thread can process uh, 10 requests a second. And by default, uh, we do have uh, 200 uh, requests. Let's see it. Yeah, we have two, 200 requests. So 200 times 10 is 2,000 requests a second. That's the theoretical maximum limit for this application if we assume that all requests take 100 milliseconds. So let's see if it really works that way. Uh, I have a Vegeta test uh, set up here. And here uh, I just say, okay, hit it with uh, 1,500 requests. And let's see what happens. Uh, there is some warm up uh, to measure uh, some reasonable uh, numbers. And then for seven seconds, we execute the test. And after, okay, and we see, okay, there is some 
hiccup at the beginning because we hit it with a lot of requests at the same time and we have only 200 threads. So there's some queuing. And then uh, all the requests take around 100 milliseconds. If you look at the numbers, like 95 percentile is zero or two, uh, one or two uh, milliseconds. So it works quite well, but we are under the theoretical limit. So if we increase the limit, uh, like if, see, if we hit it with two and a half thousand requests a second, uh, we cannot handle that. So let's see what happens. So again, warm up and then test. And yeah, and we see that the latency grows. Why it grows? Well, because it's queuing. It's like in the supermarket when you, have, you don't have enough cashiers, so the queue grows and grows and grows on, until the customers decide to leave. Uh, this is uh, the same thing what is happening here. So it doesn't scale. Or, well, does it? Let's say we need to process 10,000 requests a second. Well, there's a simple solution. I just put 1,000 here and that's it. Uh, I have... <laughs> basically make the capacity five times larger. But okay, if let's say we need 100,000 requests, can I do this? I cannot. And why? Uh, let's see uh, the test here. And uh, this is a new example. What we have here is uh, we are using executors, which are usually used for a thread pool. Uh, but today we are using new thread per task executor, so basically it creates a new thread for each task we send to it. And what we do here is we repeat it a thousand times, and what do we repeat? We submit a new task, and the task just sleeps for a second and then increments a number. At the end, we uh, close the, the thread pool and uh, print out the results. So if I execute this, it basically creates a thousand threads, each of them increments a number, and at the end we print, yeah, uh, we have incremented the number a thousand times. But what happens if I want to create 10,000 threads and all of them are active? Because all of them are sleeping at the same time. And I get an error. And it's out of memory error, and why? Uh, we, are, we, we see the stack size here is two megabytes. So if we have 10,000 threads, each of them two megabytes, it's more memory than I have available. So I cannot add more and more threads because uh, I have some limits. And of course I can try to uh, decrease the number of, uh, or the size of the stack and stuff like that, but it would be just you know, postponing the limit. So as we can see, uh, thread-based application, I will just go back to the presentation. Uh, thread-based application uh, is easy to read, easy to understand, but it doesn't scale. Uh, we have useful exceptions. Uh, important point, thread locals work, and for those who are not familiar with uh, thread locals, thread local is basically a tool you, which gives you Basically, you can attach a variable to a thread, and later, if a code is executed by the same thread, uh, you can access the value. So this is, for example, used in uh, logging when I attach request ID to a thread, and every time I log from the same thread, I log the same request ID, which, which is quite useful. And usually we know what the limit is. Usually the thread pool size on the servlet container is the limit of your application. So these are like the positive si uh, things. The negative things are that it doesn't scale. If I have a lot of requests, and let's say around 10,000 requests a second, of course it depends on, on your environment and stuff like that, uh, it doesn't scale. Or if you have long running requests. If your request takes seconds, this model doesn't work. And uh, we are talking about th threats, so let's talk about what it is, what it is. Why do we need a thread? And thread is uh, an abstraction we use for code execution, so every time I need to execute some code on CPU, I need a thread. But if I'm waiting, if I'm blocking somewhere, uh, I don't need a thread. A thread can be suspended, uh, and it has to be, because if I have more threads than CPU cores, they cannot run at the same time. 
so they have to be scheduled. Uh, somebody has to decide, okay, that this thread is running and that thread is running. So yeah, we need the operating system scheduler or some other scheduler. And they keep a uh, stack. For example, they, they remember how I got to the method. That's what I see in the stack trace. And uh, stack is also used for local variables and stuff like that. And the, the, the issue with why, why the application didn't scale is this block call here. Uh, here I'm blocking the thread for 100 milliseconds and thread is expensive as we have, can, as we have seen. So I'm blocking expensive resource for 100 milliseconds which is ages in CPU time. So we need to get rid of the block somehow. And the obvious solution is to use callbacks. I will demo a project reactor, but you can do the same using computer, uh, completable futures, listenable futures. I think in JavaScript it's called promises. It's basically the same trick that I change the return type from the random number to mono, uh, which is uh, in project reactor future holding one value. And uh, I don't have to block here because I'm saying, I'm not returning the number, random number, I'm returning something that will contain the random number in the future. Uh, I can return something else here, but again, it has to be a mono or a flux or something like that. And the trick is here that I, I place the, the code that transforms the results to a callback, to a lambda. And now there's no blocking here because the thread that executed the HTTP request can uh, leave and do something useful. And once I have the result, uh, the content of the lambda is executed. So I don't have the blocking. Uh, but uh, there's one bug in this code. Uh, I have no audience here, but I will give you a few seconds to figure out what the bug is. There is a huge, huge issue with this code. Can you see it? Yeah, hopefully somebody figured that out. Uh, the exception here is useless. Because the, when exception happens, uh, for example, the 500 from the uh, random uh, method uh, call here, uh, the thread that called, called the get random number is already gone, so there's no way how to get to the catch block. There's no thread that can reach this. So I have to rewrite the code like this. Uh, everything has to be a callback to uh, allow non-blocking code. So, and this is one, one thing that I don't like about this is everything after first blocking has to be a callback. So I have to leave Kotlin in this case and stop using try catch or only so on some places I can use it, on some places I cannot. And I have to start using some uh, data processing domain specific language just to be able to catch exceptions, which is weird. Uh, let's see how an exception looks like in this case. So again, this is the same, uh, same issue we have seen before. We passed in a negative number, and let's see how the stack trace look like, looks like. And as we can see, it's absolutely useless. There is nothing pointing to my code. And why is that? Uh, if I open the, the controller, well, the reason is that the original thread already left the method, and there's no one remembering the, the stack, how I got to the method. The only thing that happens is that some thread from the web client library calls this, this lambda, and of course it doesn't know anything about how, how I got there. So the stack trace is uh, basically useless in this case. Luckily, the uh, project reactor authors know about that, so they provide us at least some cues, uh, they call it checkpoints, saying, okay, somebody called demo reactor uh, controller, then you know the controller is called here, and we called uh, random number service, and it returned 500. I don't have uh, the line numbers, but I have some idea where approximately the error happened but the stack is, is useless. But it scales. So if, if we really need scaling, this makes sense to use. Uh, but, so it scales, I can use it with longer any requests, but everything after first blocking has to be a callback. Uh, libraries have to be asynchronous. Uh, this is usually not a problem except uh, relational databases. 
where we have R2DBC specification, which is quite, quite young. It's 0.9 version, and some of the drivers like Postgres are quite okay, but some of the drivers like Oracle are just buggy. So if I want to use non-blocking code, everything has to be non-blocking. And it's also the, the, the other point, uh, if I have an async method returning mono in my case, then the method that calls it has to return mono as well. So it spreads through, through the code and you have to rewrite most of your code. It's hard to reason about. Everything is callbacks and everything is called by some other thread and it's really much harder to, to think about. Thread locals work if you invest into making them work. Exceptions are, don't show where the error happened. And yeah, there's a limit somewhere. We have removed one limit. But basically, there is another one. Most likely, it will be some connection pool or something like that. Maybe something in the operating system. We don't know. But the, the service is not scaling infinitely. We will hit another limit uh, later. So what I always recommend, I'm saying, please, please, please use blocking unless you have reason not to. So if you know that you will need uh, to process hundreds of thousands of requests a second, please use blocking. Or if you, if you, don't, if you have long running request, okay, you have to switch to something asynchronous. But if you don't have to, please stick with the blocking. I know it's all stylish and not trendy, but it, it works. And reactive programming is really powerful and useful when you need it. When you have some data processing or data streaming and you need back pressure and stuff like that, Project Reactor is really cool, but here I, I really want to scale. I just don't want to rewrite all my code because I want to scale. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, there is one way that seems like a way out of it, and it's to use coroutines, at least if you are in Kotlin. In JavaScript, it's similar to async await. And the trick is, okay, I'll put the uh, return types back, so there is no more mono here. I just transform the mono to something compatible with coroutines, and I mark all the methods that would be blocking but are not anymore by suspend, which basically tells the compiler, you know, take this code and rewrite it to what? Uh, to callbacks, because that's basically the only trick we have uh, to get rid of blocking. So in Programming or compile time, the code looks almost like the blocking one, but compiler translates it to uh, asynchronous, non-blocking code based on callbacks. So it scales. Uh, we can we can use uh, long running request. I don't have to change the programming model. I don't have to rewrite everything to some weird uh, DSL. But libraries have to be asynchronous. Uh, it's hard to reason about. Uh, you know, part of this method is executed by one thread, and this part is executed by another, which can be confusing. Uh, again, suspended method can be only called from another suspended method, so it spreads through all the call base. Thread locals kind of work if you give it some, some time. Uh, exceptions are basically the same as in the reactor example because the original thread is already gone and nobody remembers how I got there, so the stack trace is useless. And again, there is this limit somewhere. It's not infinitely scalable. And uh, engineers at Oracle saw this and said, okay, this is strange. We have a platform and you have to pick between like easy to understand code and scalable code. Let's, let's have both. And how to do that? Well, the problem was that uh, threads are expensive. I can only have thousands of them at most. Uh, but if we make threads cheap, everything changes. And they created something they are currently calling virtual threads. And I will show you demo. So uh, one thing I haven't told you is, sorry, I'm running on Java uh, 19 early access with Loom included. If you go to Oracle pages, you can download it as well. And the only thing I'll do here is I'll replace the thread per task executor by new virtual thread per task. So instead of creating a native thread, I create something which is called virtual thread. And let's see how it works. 
So before this code failed because uh, it didn't fit into memory due to the stack sizes, but now it works. Around one second, we created tens of thousand threads, uh, put them to sleep, and then all of them incremented the number. Let's see if it can handle 100,000 threads. It can, okay, let's try with million. This is impossible. Cannot work, or can it? We'll see. And yeah, around five seconds, we were able to create million threads, uh, schedule all of them, like put them onto CPU because they need to execute some code. Then we put them to sleep, suspended them, so the stack and local variables and everything had to be stored. Then all of them woken up after one second, all of them incremented the number, and then we just discarded them. A million threads, and this is the game changer. Now I don't care about blocking anymore. So I block a thread, so what? I can create another one, I can create, million, create millions of them. And this is it. Now, now everything changes, I, I don't care about blocking. And how does it work? Uh, it's actually simple. When, when I'm executing a code, I need a thread, native thread. So every time I execute CPU code, uh, the virtual thread is uh, connected to a native thread, it's called carry thread, and they execute the code together. But when they hit blocking, uh, the native thread leaves to do something useful, and the virtual thread is blocked. And it remembers the stack and everything, but it's blocked. And when the blocking finishes, another native thread uh, gets to it and they execute the code together. And how JVM knows that it should do this mounting and unmounting? Because it knows everything about blocking. Thread sleep is JDK library method. A file system read is a JDK library method. Network access is a JDK library method. So JDK knows everything. Every time you hit blocking, JDK knows about it. Unless you use native code, then yeah, it doesn't work. And uh, how does it work? Because before we needed two, two megabytes for a stack and now we don't. How is this possible? Because JDK knows everything about your code, so uh, it can store the information more uh, concisely, so, so the, the stack can be much better and it can be shared between the threads and so on. And scheduling is also easier because, again, the JDK knows everything about your code. So, uh, let's try to use it in the real application. Uh, I will just change some configuration here, and I will restart the uh, thread, beta, thread base application. Okay. And what we do have here, this is a Spring Boot configuration. Uh, the important point is that we are using Jetty, and why? Because Jetty provides us a simple way how to replace a thread pool. And we provide our own thread pool, and it's basically not a thread pool, it's just a new virtual thread per task executor we have already seen in the example before. And every time Jetty needs to execute some code, we just create a new virtual thread and execute it on that. And we say, yeah, we have infinite number of threads and infinite number of idle threads and we never low on threads. Everything should work. And we have a production version of Spring Boot, a production version of Jetty, nothing modified. The only thing we did is we replaced the thread pool and uh, we have, of course, a JDK with Project Loom, which is doing the hard work. But other than that, like this code is unchanged. We have still the blocking here, but now we don't care because threads are cheap. So let's try and now wish me luck because this sometimes fails and uh, the reason why it sometimes fails is that the web client library we are using for calling the external service is not ready for so many threads uh, hitting it at the same time. But yeah, it works. So. Again, uh, we see that the latency stays around 100 milliseconds. If I look at the stats, yeah, P95 is uh, 102 milliseconds. So it, it scales the same way as the asynchronous code, 
but yeah, the, the code is simple and easy to reason about. So I uh, had my cake and you know, ate it too, for how the saying goes. So uh, it's easy to reason about, it's easy to debug. Exceptions work because I still have the virtual thread that remembers the stack, how I got to, to the place where the error happened. It scales, it can be used for long time requests. I don't have to rewrite all my libraries. Actually, some of them might be simplified because a lot of complexity in libraries today are, is caused due to uh, the asynchronous nature. And now we may say, okay, do we need all the asynchronous stuff? Maybe not, we, maybe we may simplify all the libraries. Uh, thread locals don't work yet, and the reason is that the engineers at Oracle decided to simplify the API because the current uh, thread local API is not nice. For example, the thread locals are mutable and there is no clear context, so basically you have to keep in mind to set the thread local and then clean it up. They, so uh, they decided to look at the API, may, maybe simplify it a bit, so they don't work yet, thread locals but they will when once it's released. There is still some limit somewhere. We have just removed one limit, but we will hit another one, maybe the connection pool. And the biggest issue is not released yet. So when is it going to be ready? Uh, Brian gets, it's Oracle, so they cannot promise anything because they have a lot of lawyers, but Brian gets says, yeah, we are polishing it around the edges, but preview is not that far off. So it will not be in Java 18 because it's due to this spring and it's in the rundown phase, so yeah, it's not there. Maybe it may be in Java 19 in, uh, in the autumn, we'll see. So the, what I want you to do today is please, please, please think twice before using async programming, before using reactor or coroutines. There is really a huge price to pay for that and so think about if you need it or not. If you don't, please stick with the blocking thread-based model and it will be easier to switch to Loom once it's ready. And the second task for you is to try to imagine a world where blocking is cheap. Threads are cheap. Threads are basically as cheap as a new instance creation. So try to imagine that, but what it means for your code and, and the libraries and everything, because that's, that's the future. For the resources, I really recommend the two-part series of State of Loom, where they explain why they do the Loom, uh, what will be the, the consequences, and so on. You can download Project Loom on Oracle pages. Uh, the, the, the source code of the demo is here. Uh, interviews Brian gets is really useful, where, where he explains why they are doing it, and what he thinks will happen to the reactor and all the async libraries that are like in popular today. And if you are into programming languages, there is a great article about async and, and JavaScript, what color is your function, and it's really, really fun to read and it's connected to this topic. So this is it from me. Uh, I will open the Slido and let's see if you have any questions. Okay, there is already one question. Uh, I will read it out loud. So aside from thread locals, you can have legacy blocking application and you can switch to use virtual threads with 100% backward compatibility. Yes, yes, that's, that's the point. Uh, at the beginning, they wanted to create a different API for, they call it fibers at the time, at the time they, then they changed the name for virtual threads. But later they decided to keep the thread API, so the thread class is implemented by the virtual thread, uh, and it should be one by one, basically replacement. So it should work, and as if you have seen, Spring Boot and Jetty and everything works with virtual threads uh, just fine. 